Hey guys, Daniel James here, and today what we're going to be doing is taking a look at Performance Samples' new library, Pacific String Ensembles. Now, the way we're going to do this is I've written a track in the background, so what we'll do is we'll listen to that first while looking at the MIDI, and then what I'll do is I'll break down uh, how I use the library in the track and how it sounds and why I used what I used. But without further ado, let's skip over to the screen and take a listen. So here we go. So as you can hear, I went for the big epic thing. As always, it's just sort of what I do. But also what I tried to do is I tried to incorporate a lot more sort of, of the dynamics, right? So I wanted to show off uh, some of the big and some of the small that this library could do. So let's, uh, let's jump in. So the first thing I always do when I'm writing a track is I always jump into the, uh, like the, the ensembles, right? The, by that, I mean like full patch ensembles. So first off, everything in that track was Pacific uh, strings ensembles. 
There's nothing else you can see here is my full string section. And for the most part, I'm using the legatos. And where I'm not, I'm actually using ensembles. I didn't even break out in sections. So the first thing I did is I loaded up uh, the whisper strings. As you can see, I've got the chord track up here. That was so you guys could follow along if you're interested in what the harmonic structure is. But what I usually do is when I start a track is I'll pull up an ensemble patch. And so I'll just quickly show you here. So in the Pacific string ensembles, they do have, and I was so thankful they have this, in the bonus content, they have full string patches. I actually use these a lot. Uh, but I, I wanted to check out these whisper sustains because the cool thing about whisper sustains is they're, they're sustains, but they're not full power. So what I could do is I can build around them. So when I write these days, what I like to do is because I've got better at piano, what I like to do is I like to play in sort of what I call scaffolding, right? So I get my sort of harmonic idea. I get the sort of vibe of what I'm trying to do on a sustain patch first, like this. Now that's quite quiet because I've intentionally turned it down, but let me see if I can quickly turn that back up a bit. Where did it go? Where did it go? I have to wait for it to load up. There we go. Right. So let me just quickly turn this up. Oh, sorry. So what I'll do is usually something like that, and it's exactly what I did here. So let's take a listen to that first by itself. What I do, well, actually, the first thing I do is I play it on piano. So first thing I would have played would have been something like this. So I get something like that. Usually I actually play it alongside. So if I actually put the two together, it would sound something like this when I'm writing. So I, I choose the uh, sustains for the sound. I choose the piano so I can do melody. So I can be like. Obviously it doesn't sound great when you're playing it live like that. But one of the cool things that I do like about these sustains is they have, like I always give other companies shit for this, but what, one of the things it does great is goes between notes without the sucking effect. And the sucking effect is when uh, a sample's release is too quick so that when you change notes, you hear like a sudden dropout. But these don't. So I, I'm able to go between chords and it sounds quite nice and pleasant, you know, like natural sounding. So what I'll do is I'll usually do something like that. So in this, in the case of this track, let's just have a quick listen to how it sounded. I, I wanted to start because I always start in, like I play in D minor. It's just a habit. I know it off by heart. Like I, I'm not the world's best piano player. So when I was learning, I started in D minor. And so I wanted to start with a fake out, like with the A, like I was going to start with A minor. But instead I start with the, uh, the seventh of a B flat major. So I start like this. Right, Sean transposed here but there we go so like this and then and what i'm doing there actually is is you it's called pedal toning but i'm doing it at the top that's where you hold a note over lots of different chords i think hans does that quite a lot like um Like his Interstellar does that, I think. 
you know so so there's a technique for you if you wanted to steal some techniques and so basically what i do there is i hold the note So anyway, let me just quickly show you a few of these chords. And so what I'll do is I'll build what I call scaffolding, right? As, as I mentioned before this stream, like one of the latest comments on my YouTube was I look like I, I physically look like a kitchen fitter. I, I'm pretty sure that was meant as an insult, but I know plenty of cool kitchen fitters. So, you know, take that with what, take that how you will. But one of the things I like to do is build scaffolding, right? So I get the sort of melodic structure of what I'm doing in a general direction. If you look, you can sort of see the flow of the track. And then what I'll do is I'll take something like that and I'll start building my melodic pieces off. So here is the, the, the legato cello, right? And so I just start filling in that, that, that uh, scaffolding with uh, melodic lines. And that's one of the things I absolutely love about this library is the tone of the legato. So I've seen a lot of people and a lot of videos commenting that it has sort of a slurred legato as, as sort of a almost portamento type. And so the way that I see this library is it's sort of designed to be the kind of music that I've written. It's sort of designed to be that Ralph Vaughan Williams emotional, big sweeping score type sound. And so when you think of it in that context, it makes a lot of sense why it is done that way. So if you think about how when you have a, uh, a violin player, when you sample, when you sample normally, if you just have them going, da, 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 you have all the time in the world to hit that legato transition like this. Even that's quite slurred, actually. And now, when you're playing, when you're playing uh, in real life, one of the things that happens is because when you're playing lines that are emotionally and you're leaning into them and stuff, one of the things that happens to the actual player is they're anticipating the note beyond the next note. So if they're going to go uh, A, C, D, like this, when they're going between the A and the C, they're already thinking about going to the D. That's what she said. But anyway, uh, they're already thinking about going to the D. So what they do is I, I when I hear that slur, what I'm hearing is the anticipation of the next note. It's So if you think about it, when you play, if you're playing a line, particularly if it's fast and emotional, you're not just sitting there going, da, 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 da. You're, try, you're going to go, da, da, da. You want it to kind of slide up to the note. You want it to kind of, with the emotion, you want it to flow up to the next note. And so as you're sort of leaning in, it turns into that sort of slide into the next note like this. Like you wouldn't want a line like that to be like, da, 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 da. I mean, sh some people might, but the way that I hear music like that being written, the way that it's presented when it's played live, and I've been fortunate enough in my career to have worked live quite a few times now. Whenever they do lines like that, they tend to, uh, 
I don't think the word slur is correct. I think they sort of flow into the next note. And so when I've seen people like demonstrating this, this legato, they go... And it's like, I, you never really hear people doing that as music, right? Like just in isolation. If you were going... Like if I was to go between these two notes and keep doing it, you wouldn't be going... Nah, nah, nah. You would be going... Duh, 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 duh. And that's what normal legato sounds like, right? But in the context of an actual track, if you think about it, having it flow like that makes, to me at least, it makes more sense because then it sort of... <laughs> that's, that slur, that flow leads you to the next note. So to me, uh, I, I didn't find it as an issue. So let me just jump back to the track. So as you can see here, I've, I've got like this legato and cello sort of line going against each other. Oh, I should have made, maybe made that a harmony. I could have fixed that. Doesn't matter now, it's too late. Actually, it's not too bad because I miss out the middle notes. That clash seems a bit odd. <laughs> I never said I was great. Where was that clash? But if I put it in the context of the scaffolding. you like it. And that's actually like, I'm seeing a lot of people talking about the way that the legato sounds in this library as a negative. I'm genuinely seeing it as a positive because most libraries tend not to do it in that manner. They tend to do it a lot more straightforward, a lot more sort of da da. And that is absolutely fine. However, when I'm writing emotional music like this, I want it to feel like the players are leaning into the melody, right? So if I bring in the high part here, I'll take away the, uh, the backing. I'll put in the bass with it. So this is just the four legatos playing together. Uh, I'll just play it from here. So as you heard there, and someone like appropriately in the chat just mentioned, the one thing that I don't like so far is that it doesn't have a repeated note phrase. So uh, a bow change legato. So for example, if I play the same note twice, which happens here, you do get a bit of a sound as opposed to a dun dun. It doesn't feel like the bow change. And that is unfortunate. Like I do hope that if they ever do an update, we get something like that. That where, did it, where is it? Like here. And it's it's okay. D d on the viola, I, I think it was a bit bit more noticeable. Let me just. So you get more of a da 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 da, which you know. I'm not a fan of, like, I wish it would, like, uh, have a bow change. So, again, that's just the same as if you're playing the same note, you just then bow in the opposite direction, which gives you another transient, basically. It gives you another attack on the note. 
which, you know, generates a, a unique uh, rhythm to it. So a lot of what a lot of people do is they don't realize that you can play the same note more than once in a melody. Like a lot of people think you need to keep moving up and down. You can stay on the same note and go da 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 da. And so I if if ever there was an update, I I hope and pray that we get a bow change because that would make it, you know, usable in every single situation. So what I tend to do is I tend not to. So that was actually, uh, that would have been a bow change there. But as, as it dips down in sound, what I tend to do is I tend to just not, I tend to just keep it as a sustain. And then when you have something like the winds with it, it sort of covers it up. And that's just one of the te techniques I use for all, uh, all sampled instruments. It's like when it has a flaw, it's like, can I sort of cover it up? Does it matter in the grand scheme of things? No, but I know that some people like to have their strings in isolation, so I fully understand why you would want it. And another thing I did, another thing I do sometimes, I think I did it here, is I will add like a, like if I have a spiccato or a staccato somewhere, <clears throat> when I do the, when I want the bow change, I'll just put a little staccato layered with where that uh, bow change should be. So it adds it, but you know, I wish that it existed as its own thing. So anyway, as you can see, most of this track is just legato. So I'll just show you a few different uh, ways that I used it. So... So this is just the four legatos together once I turn off the winds. Now, I actually like the way that sounded. Again, it's, it's doing that sort of flowing type legato, but when you're going fast, like it couldn't do really, really fast. But when you're going like fast enough, so this is what, 16th at uh, 82. So that's like 164 BPM. Like if you were, you know, if you were thinking in that way, not that you would. Again, this is just the legatos. No, how valor, don't mess with the chat, not while I'm doing a stream. God damn it. Anyway, so as you can hear, like it flows beautifully with itself. It's once you get everything put together, it starts to actually sort of make more sense when you have that flowing legato. Again, just, just listen to how the legatos are all individually flowing, right? They're all doing that slurred type thing. But when you get it going together, they all sort of flow into each other and it creates a more, a more sort of musical uh, way of leaning into itself. And so as you, as you can hear, that was just the legato. So as I mentioned, I always have the whisper sustains in the background. It's like a little tip I always do. It just fills out the, 
the harmonic structure. I, I do have them turned up louder, I think, than they are normally. But if I just play it with the whisper sustains in the background, which are beautiful sounding. Just to show you what the Whisper Sustains were doing by himself there. Uh, And the reason I do that is like that is the tonal sound that I want. And as I was trying to show legato off, it's easier when I have that sort of environment with which to build. So then, you know. And I always do it in ensemble. I know a lot of people are like, oh, but it's not real if you do it that way, DJ. And it's like, sure, fair enough but I never need it to be more. Like to me, that sounds pleasing enough. And I know a lot of people are like, it's not realistic to do it that way. And that's sure. They're like, you, you've got too many players, DJ. But one of the cool things I've learned, again, since my, my fortunate amount of time working with uh, real players, is that you can usually overdub them. So I will have them play this once. You know, so I'll, I'll break this down into its individual, you know, lines for the players to play and then have them play this and then do another pass where the cello players play this and then do another pass where they get on the uh, staccatos and they play this. So you can do this live. You just can't do it in a live performance, <laughs> right? But most of the time we're not like what I do isn't writing for live performance. So anyway, uh, so we then we go really quiet. So I wanted to show it very delicate. So there you probably heard that we had the spiccatos. Again, I do, I do the shorts. Unless I'm trying to do something very particular, a lot of the time I just work for the ensemble. Right, and I'm not going to try and play it because there's so much delay because of the stream. So I'll just show you. <clears throat> so let's just have a listen to the kinds of things I was doing. 
And here's one of the things I love about this library. The spiccatos are so short and snappy, but they sound natural and in time at the same time. Like a lot of the times it's like one of those triangles where you get a bit of both. You either get them sharp sounding, but they're like sloppily timed, or you get them like perfectly in time, but they're not particularly sharp or they don't particularly go fast. Here, like the, I could almost get them to the level of measured trems, which is like a tremolo that's played in time pretty much. Right, And I didn't need to put those on their own individual things because when you put them together in the ensemble, they sound just fine. They sound as if they're all on their own things. However, if I was in like a different key, you need to be careful using ensembles that they don't accidentally go to a different instrument like this. So you'll see like these parts will be in the left speaker, but these parts go into the right speaker. So sometimes I'll move and, and I'll break it up into individual on uh, individual sections doing spiccatos if like I need to keep it in range. But most of the time, unless it's up in the foreground, it doesn't really matter to the piece because it sounds great just as it is. But this is what it would sound like if it was like crossing into different sections. And sometimes it can actually sound cool because then you end up getting a sort of auto pan effect. So if you don't care too much about being specifically realistic, instead you're aiming for good, you know, good sounding. It can actually give an interesting vibe. So if you listen, it will like jump between left and right, which is actually kind of its own thing, which I also like, you know. I wonder how low this can go before it starts to sound weird. And the same, I'll, I'll go up a few and see what it sounds like really high. So what I'm doing rhythmically is I, is I basically have a few things going on. I have, I'll just mute these ones for now. So at the bottom line, I have, so that's the pulse, right? Dun, 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 dun. And as you can hear those low, the low cellos there, just really digging in. Like I can really give, uh, let me just accent some of these. I'll do it. I'll do it. So it's like one, two, three. I'll do it like, uh, so it's three plus three plus two, which isn't the rhythm I'm doing, but it'll sound... You'll, it'll change the feeling of the rhythm, but that's what I like about the sound of these uh, spiccatos is they dig in. You know what I mean? When you play loud, you get sort of that slap of the string. Now if I drop these down into like the bass range. If I put it in the mid range. So now if I show you, like I actually did that with this line here. So let me just mute all this again. It's a bit tricky. It's tricky when you put it in an ensemble to show it to other people because you have to mute things out. But as you can see here, I've I've uh, used the, um, you know, it's important when you're doing short notes. Like I, I see a lot of people just do it like this, you know, where they'll just, or whatever, whatever this line is. But you'll see that the, they're all the same velocity, which will sound fine but it won't have, you know, it won't feel like it has its own internal rhythm within it. Whereas when you add, you see like how these are red and these are purple. So purple being quiet, the redder they are, the louder. Even though it's not much of a difference, you get to hear da, 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 and you hear the rhythm. So you're creating the pulse, right? One, one cool tip that I did, by the way, is I made it so that, uh, let's just say that I had like loads of things that were saying, and this is worth doing if you have Cubase, just as a side note, I've set up a button that I push and it'll just randomize it a little bit. I don't know if you can see, if you look down at the bottom here, look at the black lines, you see them all just sort of moving around. 
and it just sort of makes them, it randomizes the velocity of every note. So what I'll do is I'll program it, hit that so that they're all playing slightly different velocities and then go in after the fact and add in the accents. And the accents are usually what you would uh, correspond with the, the actual rhythm of the piece. So if I just unsolo this for a second, you'll hear this line by itself going with the, the melody. Oh, wait. I've definitely put it in the wrong key, haven't I? <laughs> where was I? Right. Let's put it, everything back to where it was. There we go. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Right. Uh, so I'll just make this all go away again. And let me just solo the strings. So I'll show you each of these parts, like how they fit in with the actual piece here. So. Uh, right. So I'll put it with the whisper sustains. There we go. So you see how just adding those little accents gives you the pulse, and then we put the different rhythm with it. This one's playing a more uh, just playing the same thing, so there's no accents on this. The reason I didn't do that is because it's already accented here, and if I do it, like if I accented it the same, I mean, it might sound fine, but it didn't need it, you know what I mean? Like it would almost overpower it, I think. So I'm just sort of filling out the chord with that bottom one. All right, really good sounding cello spiccatos there. All right, let's just bring this top one in. We'll get rid of the bottom bit for now. All right, and then. And here, like this was a cool tip. So like this library doesn't have measured trems uh, again, which is a really cool sounding uh, effect. It's sort of like doing a tremolo in time, which usually sounds like really fast spiccatos. And most, like, not most, but a lot of libraries can't do short notes that fast together. So like they will start to sort of smudge and sound smeared together when you uh, when you go like this fast. But if you listen, you're actually getting a lot of detail and a lot of accent on every single note, even though it's really fast. So you end up sort of with a measured trem. There's one at the bottom there. And another cool thing that I do, another cool thing is if I'm cool, uh, another thing I do is I layer it with the legato. So you actually end up with the sound of the, the uh, almost like a measured trem, but because I've added a legato behind it, it sounds like the measured trem has legato within it. So you get this. You can't see it, the measured trems are actually behind. So I'm actually putting them together and then that way you sort of get the flow of that, like what people are calling that sort of slurred legato, but you're also getting the sort of uh, measured trims over the top and it adds together. And let me just put in the rest of the short. And so you're getting all of that energy. Like, don't think of it as like legatos or techniques. Think of it as energy. When it flows, you're getting that sort of emotional, like lean into the next note. That's how I hear it. And then when you add in like this pulse and this energy of all the short notes underneath, what you're doing is creating a lot of energy and anticipation. And so you're, you're then converting like musical concepts into emotional concepts, right? So you end up with them all together. 
Exactly. Thank you, Royce. And it's forward pushing. So I'm like, da 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 And everything, even including the legato, the way the notes are playing, leads into the next note, which is pulling you forward. Like, that's one thing I'm always trying to do, particularly in action tracks, is keep the music feeling like it's pulling you to the next bit so that you're not just sort of meandering around in, like, musical noise for the sake of music, right? Right, you feel that pull. And the cool thing is here, there's actually a psychoacoustic, that these spiccatos never actually go up this high. They never hit this high note. Because like, if you see, I do them an octave down, just because I felt like being weird at this little moment. But it sounds like the measured trems go up there because your ear gets used to it being uh, in unison here. So if you listen, even though I separate it and it makes the chord sound bigger, and the reason I did it there, by the way, is because I do a, a modulation here. So I'm accenting the modulation just by changing something in the sound. It's a good idea to do that just because it, the modulation by itself will catch your ear. But if you sort of accent it with all these little bits and little details, it'll feel like more intentional rather than you just sort of stumbled upon it. <laughs> and then it goes to a different note. And then we do something similar here. So again, same concept. So what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm again, pulling you forward into the uh, melody. So if I just show you quickly what it is without the sustains. So from now, there would normally be. But if we pull, uh, if we pull in the, the shorts here, listen to how everything gets a drive. And again, Pacific strings are really, really good at just accenting. Like if you look, it's the accents aren't that far apart, but you really get a feel for it. Again, I'll, so what I'll do now is I'll play it and I'll pull that, that out so you can hear the difference. just show you that part by itself again pay attention to how tight the pacific strings are doing here like <laughs> that's that's what i mean it's like spiccatos and short notes in general are, are not overlooked but they're not usually given the nuance that they deserve so as you can see here like there's some very subtle changes in the like the, i'm not really changing much in terms of the actual velocity but if you listen it's got like a, its own energy that's sort of within itself but it's got a very natural tone to it. something a bit short here. Again, not a difficult line.
I think we use the shorts a bit over here. So then we just sort of rebuild it at the end. So. Again, I'll take this out. So that brings us to our next bit, which is the marcatos. Again, I use them in ensemble, just the way I, I roll. Uh, the reason I did it that way is because I like to do sort of, when I'm doing the marcatos, unless I'm doing like an actual, uh, unless I'm doing like an actual. Like I like, sorry, that was how I use it, but. Unless I was doing something big like that. And usually if I was doing something like that, I'd probably do it as on, uh, individual parts anyway. But what I like to do is when I am when I have marcatos, I like to just do the bass line with it like this, but in octaves with the cello. So... What was the... Oh, I won't play any copyright things there. But. And I, I don't know if you guys can tell, but these these marcatos, as the kids would say, slap. Oh, we got a stuck note. How did that happen? All right, let's try it again. And so the way I use them here is literally just a really solid bass line. And I very intentionally didn't use them for the rest because I wanted this part where we have the modulation to really hit hard. And these marcatos are by far the best marcatos I've heard in a string library. you'd be like can you hear the kind of slap in the what I like to do usually is like layer that with the brass uh which one it would be this one i think uh, so. oh wait i need to actually go and
especially Dan. Beautiful sound. I wonder if I've got a. Have I got a? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. There we go. Get the tubers in there. Maybe with that brass as well. Sorry. Now I'm just playing, but <laughs> indulge me for a second. So it's good for the bass. Yeah, you get the old uh, James Horner thing going. As you can hear, really, really snappy. One thing I would like to show, so if I just bring up the UI, uh, as you can see, like I haven't really done much to them. The one thing I always do, particularly with performance samples ones, a good one to show would be the cello. I always turn up the close mic and I always pan the close mic. So at normal, it would sound like this. If I turn up the close mic, And again, I always pan the close mic to where it would sit in the room. And then I leave the uh, the AB mic, which is like the, the one in the center above. I always leave that in the center. Or if I really want to push something to the side, sort of pull it across. But what I like to do is leave that in the middle so that you end up with the sort of uh, echo of it on the left if I just turn this mic off. I turn it back on. Yeah, but I always do it like slightly. So that's what it would be by default. And as you pan it. Which may not sound like a big deal, but when you have like the violin and the cello together, with the violin pan slightly left, you end up I'll put them back in the middle. That's with them both down the center. So you see how that just sort of spreads it out and gives you more of the, the uh, you know, the stage feeling. So I always do that with performance samples. I do that with most string libraries in general. If I have the option of multiple microphones, I always push the close mic off to the side where I want it to feel like it's positioned in the room. And that gen generally sort of fixes that. Again, I'll just put them in the center and listen. I'll move them as it's playing. But listen how they like they're sort of clashing with each other in the middle. And then if you pan one off to the side, you sort of get that space and that nice feeling of everything. I'll wait till we get to the next section.
And so you end up with the, the AB mic still down the center, but because that's sort of what it would be like based on how you actually have the microphone set up, it seems to make sense that way to me. And to be honest, that sounds good to me. So I, I, I usually leave it like that. Right, moving down, I do have like the occasional uh, tremolo in here. So let's take a listen to that. But I'm only using it very quietly. I use it here. I use it there briefly because my melody note, this was actually Andrew pointed this out to me, Andrew Osano, who's doing great, by the way. He just had a film released with Nicolas Cage in it. He's absolutely killing it. So I'm loving it right now. Anyway, so my, my section, uh, my melody goes to an A instead of a D, uh, but it feels like it wants to go up to the D. Uh, just here. That's where it feels like it wants to go, right? So it goes. But my melody is duh, duh, duh. So I, I use it there to just sort of fill in that D there. You know, and it, it fills out the chord, but then it just doesn't make that transition transition feel awkward. But it's one of those things that I didn't spot till he pointed it out. But again, the tremolos sound absolutely beautiful, although I think I just turned them down. There we go. There we go. Again, I use, I use all these extra ones in ensemble. Like the way that I generally work is I'll have my main melodic parts as legato, as sections, and then everything else that's going to supplement that or I'm going to jump to occasionally, I'll just have as an ensemble. Because then that way I don't have to fill up my RAM with loads of, you know, patches that I use like this. Like if this was just on its own patch and then over here, let's say I had a cello that went for one bar, it wouldn't make sense to have it as a separate thing. So anyway, let me just... getting some sticky notes today interesting i didn't get those when writing so i wonder why they're happening i wonder if it's the stream all right let's do some dynamic tests let's see what it sounds like really low i love that the rumble Now these, these don't have as much of a release and the release is already at what it is. Yeah. One of the cool things, by the way, is this little B button, I used to think it was bypass for some reason, but it's like the extra features are, not extra features, but the extra controls, if you click this B button, so you can change the dynamic remapping. I never do really, because I like it. I should have used the makeup because I, I was turning these up at some point, but I realized I was turning the microphones up but that's fine because I wanted to accent more of the clean sound. But you can compress the, the dynamic range. So you, that just basically means that it's all gonna be, it's like a compressor. So, so the loud parts and the quiet parts will be the same, except it, instead of turning it up, it goes low. So I can, there we go. So that's it with the modulation all the way down. Then this is, moving the modulation all the way to the top, but this allows you to keep them at the exact same volume. So as I move the mod wheel up. You can hear that you can hear it getting more intense, but without the volume. So that's just basic if you wanted to compress them without having to put a compressor on it. But I tend not to do that just because I prefer writing with it this way. Oh wait, I turn the make up to infinite zero. Don't want to do that. Oh, good God. Uh, so, and this is pretty cool too. So compressing the high register, so it, it will do it so that the, the high register, right, the low register will stay the same. So you can make the loud bit go loud without the top bit. Whereas if I played that same thing, right, the loud overtakes. So it's a good way, like if you 
if you're using an ensemble patch and the like the highs are poking through too much and the lows aren't you can there you go so that's pretty good but because it's compressed when you turn it down they'll obviously stand out a bit more Right, but these do have a little bit of that sucking effect that I was talking about. And the sucking effect is, is just when the tail of the actual patch you're playing dies out before you get to your next note. So if I was to... Again, sorry for that being loud. Whereas if I use something like the Whisper Sustains... So, uh, but there, and also there's not much I can do to change it because the release is already as far as it will go. Something I do want to mention, I, I, I chastise companies for this all the time, but one thing I absolutely love is that the sample offset is put on every single patch, right? So you can see the sample offset on the Legatos is minus 180 on the, uh, well, not for all of them. And, and it's the, the playback offset that you want. And you can actually change it, it seems like. Right, and anyway, so uh, you come down, a lot of these I don't use, and I really should figure them out at some point. But one of the things I always try to do when I do these videos is I intentionally don't read any manual. I don't look at anything. I don't look at other people's uh, reviews or anything because I want to see how the library works just as it's presented. And like, so I do I do wish I knew what the uh, the bow, wait, where is it? It was on one of these. Where is it? The, the bow direction. Like, I'm not sure exactly what that does. And it's on number seven. So if I hit C minus one, where are you? That's interesting. Doesn't seem to do anything. You see what I mean? <laughs> Anyway, right. But anyway, the playback offset is minus 100. So if I just show you like that. So here you see it's minus 100, right? And just to show you what that does in, in practical sense. Right, so if this was zero, this is a delay offset. It's You'll have to figure, it, uh, figure out where it is for your own DAW. But if you look here, for me, so if I play this up against the click, you hear it's out of time? That's what this means. So the playback offset or the sample offset. I mean, it's 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 labeled different things, but you it's usually offset something. And most companies just don't tell you what it is. You have to figure it out. A good way of figuring it out, usually, if it doesn't tell you, is you just load up one patch or whatever, and then you just do fourths, you know, like do quarter notes. And then you'd be like, well, what is it? Is it minus 50? No, that's closer. Is it minus 80? There you go. Or is it even more minus 100? And you can actually, like, one way of doing it, it depends on the kind of music, because if you want to rush it a little bit, you can pull that offset forward before what it is. So the playback offset on this is minus 100. I actually liked it at minus 80. Oh, not 780. You see, you see how that's just behind the beat? I wonder how that sounds actually. It rushes a little bit. Changes the feeling.
But if I put it to 100, minus 100, or not 110, So that's what those do, really useful. Right, what else did we use? So we used the Markar, and there's also things in this that I didn't use, but so we'll have a quick look at those now. <clears throat> right, we'll look in the bonus content first. In fact, no. Uh, so we've got different um, Whisper sustains. So the Trills I haven't looked at yet, Sordinos I didn't look at. I could have used those, to be honest, but I just love the Legato, so I was leaning into those pretty hard. So let's load up the Sordino sustains on the cello. In f yeah. So Dino sustains. So they're not actually legato. I'm just going to make it so I can see all of my tracks in the background there. So these are Sordinos, just muted, basically. Right, so let me just set this up. Just going to set up a pad. What I'll do is I'll bring bring the violas. I'll get them doing trills if we can. Where are the trills? How do these work in this one? That's cool. So the way you do it is you play your first note. So here I'll play a D. And then if I wanted the... Uh, minus second, is it minus second? The, the, the E would make that one. F, like if you play them together, the F gives you that. If you look down at the keyboard at the bottom, I just realized my face is in the way. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to scan it through a hold that. Put the whisper sustains up on the top. Get that vibe going. You have to remember, these are sustained. So when I was playing that line, that isn't legato, right? It's just got a good tail. Again, there's no sucking effect. There's a good release on it. Right, let me bring in the violins. What, what have we got on the violins? Let's bring in the... Yeah, we'll bring in the whisper sustains on the violins. And then in the basses, we'll bring in the, the pizzicatos for now. So let's just, you know, for our ears sake, change key. So let's get the whisper sustains in general, just doing a. And then we'll have our trills. I'll get them doing a... They're quite tricky to trigger. Yeah, we'll hold that.
beautiful sounding, beautiful sound. So as you can hear, it all works really good together. But the other cool thing is that the sustains almost sound like legatos within themselves. love that so much now let me try changing the cello which one was that number 10 let me try changing the cello to uh, let's go with let's do the cello as whisper sustain this time and we'll have the viola do sordino and we'll have the violins do sordino So the cello now doing. Go to a different view.
etc. I'm going to be there playing forever. But as you can see, sounds absolutely beautiful within itself, no matter whether you layer the legatos with the whisper, the whisper with the sordino, the sordino with the trills, the tremolo, no matter what it is, it all fits together. And consistency with these types of things is very, very important. You know, so you can set, where is this? You can set like some trems up like that. Have... And bringing an actual legato. Stop it all with the sustain pedal. So as you can hear, absolutely beautiful. There is a bit more bonus content. There is three violins. Uh, these are just like really loud. Uh, the three violins that are playing extremely loud that you can put over the top. I'll just double a line in this. Uh, so let's take this line, the violin legato. Let's put it on channel 10, which is currently occupied by the cellos. But we'll just put it there for now. Uh, just solo the string. So now it's just going to double the, right, what's the playback on it? Number 10. Uh, it's, you know, so I go to the tap. Sample offset is minus 180. So I just go to that, set that up there. So it's the same time. And then I'll find a particularly loud part like near the uh, beginning here. Now, these ones are a bit portamento-y, more, more like slurry, I guess. But I bet it works fine when you've got like the large, uh, like the big melodies. Like that, that I would say is leaning into the sort of slurred sound. Whereas this, I don't hear it as bad. Uh. You know what I mean? Like that's nowhere near as...
Again, we just listen to the difference. So when people are talking about the slur, like, I... <laughs> I guess because if you know how far a slur can go, you don't hear it as much. To me, I don't hear this. Like this to me is what, like if all of the library sounded like this, I would understand people complaining, but I don't hear it anywhere near as, as strong as that. Again, when I hear it on the actual legato patches, I hear it considerably more like it's forward flowing energy than I hear it as a slur or portamento. But it sounds absolutely amazing. The only other patch we haven't taken a look at yet is the uh, the, the normal pluck, well, the harmonic pluck. Why am I saying the harmonic pluck? The harp is what I was trying to say. But like, it's not normally something I would lean into. Oh, it sounds good though. Okay, okay. Right, let's just let's set something up. Sounds beautiful. I know you wouldn't play harp like that, by the way.
So what does the harmonic one sound like? Sounds almost like a music uh, box. I think I prefer the uh, the normal one. hard to play uh, things like that. Good. Oh wait, we didn't look at the uh, the cluster risers. I'll take a quick look at those. The cluster shorts. Let's look at them. Fourteen. All right. So these. Are... So these are just if you're doing some horror things. <laughs> and the risers are just risers, I imagine.
don't actually sound really solid. But yeah, I think we've covered everything there. Oh, we didn't do the bass much. The bass, I want to hear bass tremolos actually. Bass tremolos are always one of the most important. Here I should have, I want to layer the tremolo with the, so I'm going to layer bass tremolo with a timpani, because that's usually how I would put them. So you'd have like, Sounds great. But anyway, so those are the patches that I would use the most. And as you can hear uh, in the track, you know, I'll, I'll just give you one last burst of just the strings doing this final bit. As you can hear, the consistency between them is the thing that makes this library worth it for me, is how well all the aspects fit together. And I know that the, the flowing legato is, is a hanging point for a lot of people, but I genuinely don't see it as too much of a slur. I see it as the type of music this is designed to be used in. You would want that kind of thing. And as you can hear here, as you can hear in this bit of the music at the end is exactly the type of thing I think it's designed to do. And I think it pulls it off in, I think it pulls it off perfect. On that note, that covers all, all of the content that's pretty much in there that I would use. And so in conclusion, this library, from what I've seen, has been quite contentious because of the way the legato works. And I understand what people are saying. It does have a more extended legato than you would usually get. To me personally, I love it because it's the kind of music I write. I write this big emotional uh the way I hear it is like that Ralph Vaughan Williams. If anybody's familiar with the classical comp composer Ralph Vaughan Williams, it's very much that style of music. And so for someone like me, I mean, I have a lot of string libraries already. So for me, the, the, where this library is going to fit in is whenever I need to do something that's in that sort of emotional, I need to make people feel like the players are really feeling what they're playing and leaning into every note. Because to me, I don't hear the legato as a slur. I hear it as an anticipation. So to me, it's like anticipation legato. So like I said, if, if the melody that we're going to play goes A, C, D, like this...
when when you go between the A and the C, in my mind, that legato is hearing the D note before it's even gone A to C. So when you go A, C, D, it, if you just went back and forward between them, you hear it because like you wouldn't play that sort of motion with that sort of legato, right? But going like this, you would because you, you're anticipating that third note. So it's almost as if the legato anticipates the note beyond. So when you're doing notes that are doing lots of legato like this track does, like the whole piece, if I just show you one, one more time uh, on the screen, if you look at the way I'm actually composing this, I'm using lots of moving legato. So these, like when you go between these notes, it's as if it's already anticipating this note. So that's how I'm hearing it. I don't hear it as though it's meant to do a normal one and then it's doing a slurred one instead, which is, I think, uh, like the sort of expectations we've been trained in sample libraries to expect because they all do that. And that, I think, is genuinely because when you record people, you get the duh, 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 and they've got plenty of time to do that legato transi transition. Whereas when you play live, you're thinking five notes ahead of where you already are. And so you naturally tend to sort of already head towards the note beyond the next one you're going to play before you've even played the next note. So you're already sort of moving towards, like magnetically almost, moving towards where you want to go after the next note you're going to play. And to me, it sounds like a flowing legato or an anticipation legato. However, I do understand that it, for those of you who are wanting to do something a bit more static and with less emotional flair, perhaps this wouldn't be for you. However, if you have a library already, let's say like a BBC orchestra or a Nucleus or, you know, a Cine, Cine Samples, uh, I forget what they call theirs, but one of these libraries where you've got a bit of everything so that you already have a standard legato, I could not recommend this library more to add on to that because that means whenever you go into these emotional types of music, you're going to have the players sound as though they're leaning into the note, which is what you want them to do when they play live. You don't want them to play statically. You want them to feel the next note. And that, to me, is being given by Pacific String. So I absolutely love the legato as it is. If they do decide to add an option, that would be fantastic. Uh, another alternative is, is Vista. If any of you know Performance Samples Vista, it does have a more standard legato. So doing the two together would be a, a, like, maybe we'll do a video in the future where we put those together. That would be worthwhile. The short notes are incredible. They, they are short, snappy, in time, which you would expect in this day and age of them all to do, but not every library does short notes in time. Uh, they're so snappy and tight that you can almost do tr uh, measured trems with them. Uh, the marcatos are the meatiest marcatos I've ever heard in a string library. So if you're looking to do that kind of dun, 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 absolutely, definitely pick this up. What else do we feel? The, the effects sounded cool. I'm, I don't use them much. The extra articulation, so the whisper sustain, the sordinos, uh, the trills and the tremolos, all sound fantastic and they all sound consistent. Again, not something that is a given in all the libraries. They all sound like they are the, the, in the, recorded in the same room, in the same place, doing the same thing with the same people. So who is this not for? Uh, if, if you're someone, who, again, like I mentioned, if you want that kind of legato that is just a bit more standard, then okay, I understand that. One thing I do wish this had, uh, two things actually, I wish it had uh, re-bowing, so that when you play the same note more than once, instead of it like losing the attack, you get another attack as if there was a legato transition. Uh, and what else? What was the other thing I was going to say? Oh, and the other thing would be a multi for every instrument. So I absolutely love the sound of the sordino, the marcato, the spiccato. I love all the sounds of each, but they are all on individual patches. I would love, I know that the patch would be a huge one, but I would love if there was a way that we could key switch between the articulations as we're composing in real time. So I, you know, that would be my, that would be my approach. That's what I would choose to do if I had the option so that I could go da, 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 brrr, you know, and then move into a tremolo. And so, 
you know, like as it is right now, they're all split into individual patches. And I think there is a way where you can set it to key switch, but you would have to take up an entire instance of contact in order to do it. Oh, apparently it does have rebowing. You have to use sustain pedal. That's why I enjoy doing these live because I get called out on it. Oh my God, you're actually right. Okay, so I will say that that isn't well presented. Thank you, chat room, for telling me that. Let me just try that on a line and see how it sounds. Because the problem I have is if you leave the sustain on, it works as a sustain. Okay, I take that back. It doesn't need the rebowing. However, having it on sustain, I feel, can be dangerous because if you accidentally leave the sustain on, you can fuck up the MIDI. And trust me, I definitely leave the sustain on. Let me just quickly try putting that in there and see if it makes it sound better. Yeah, this is why, because look, trying to set up sustain to be on one note is an awkward thing to do. Again, this is why I like doing these things live, because not only do I learn things as I do them, but also it allows me to show you that it doesn't seem indicated well on the UI. And that is something I give all developers crap for. So let me just see if it's indicated well and I just missed it. You see what I mean? There's nothing here on the UI that would suggest that you can rebow with the sustain pedal. And I always make a point of saying that the reason I do this, and I know this makes a lot of people angry, the reason I do these streams without doing all the deep research and reading the manual and everything beforehand, which you are more than welcome to do, by the way, but the reason I do it the way I do is because I know that most people out there don't read the manual. As a developer myself, I'm acutely aware that people never read the manual. And so what I like to do is show the library as it's going to be presented to most people. And if something is hidden behind as an extra feature and not telegraphed well to the user, then it's something that they will not use. Like me, I didn't know that that rebowing was there until the chat pointed it out. So if there's a way that they can indicate that on the UI, they can indicate rebowing with sustain pedal, something like that, just says it somewhere or an option where you can turn it off. That would be super useful because then people aren't going to miss parts of the library that they would otherwise see. So let me just quickly test this line with now with the rebowing. Perfect. Perfect. That's all it needed. All I needed to know. However, the problem is, is if you accidentally do it and then this gets turned off. Actually, that wouldn't like if I didn't have notes. You end up with it sustaining the actual note. So <laughs> I don't know what the option would be there. Maybe if it was on something other than the sustain, but I understand so that people can play live. Okay, so I take that back. It doesn't need rebowing. But yeah, so not it's not indicated well that you can do that. And that is a feature that I would use. Thank you again, chat room, for doing that. That's one of the pleasant things of going live. So you can rebow. So I take that back. So it's got one less negative than I had before. The other things I would like, as I mentioned, would be the multi. Oh, and that was it. That would just be it. So I don't need the rebow. But yeah, uh, so to me, it sounds fantastic. You heard it, the track, uh, the strings themselves sound incredible. The shorts are short and snappy and powerful. The marcatos work great. All the extended articulations sound amazing. The only thing that you, the only question you have to ask yourself is, do I like the legato or not? If it's not for you, maybe check out Vista or you know one of the various other string libraries out there. But if you already have string libraries and you want to add more emotion, I would definitely consider this. But all in all, I think this library is an absolute definite worth buying. Uh, it's currently, uh, what, what is it currently at its uh, sale price? As I do this uh, strings, let me just quickly see how much it is today as I'm doing the video on January 15th. Right, so it's currently $249 as a loyalty intro, and then it'll be $399 uh, as the intro price, and it'll be $600. So it is a very expensive library, which may put it out of the reach of a lot of hobbyists. But if you're a professional, I still absolutely think this is worth the money. And again, I, I see this as a comment a lot when it comes to how much libraries cost. If you're a professional, 
and you're going to make money with the library. It's not a sunk cost. It's an investment. So you're spending the money on the library now and you will recoup it because the thought process is you will use the library to make you money. And then once you've made the value of it back, anything from that point on is pure profit from having from just owning the library because now you will have access to more sounds and approaches and tones than the competition. So therefore you can compete at a higher level. Always consider that when you think price. Uh, as I mentioned, I did receive this as a review copy. So, you know, always, as I always say, take everything I say with a grain of salt if you want to. But I always, I always give my honest and blunt opinions. Uh, so I hope you guys enjoyed. <laughs> my dog's enjoying it as well. I hope you guys enjoyed. Uh, oh, oh, okay. 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 She doesn't want me to end the stream. That's what it is. So anyway, on that note before the dog goes crazy. If you're watching this on YouTube, this is where the video is gonna end. I hope you found it useful. I hope you enjoyed the track. It's on Spotify now. I'll put the link down below and all that. Uh, if you are on the stream, stick around for a while. We'll be hanging about for a little bit longer. But until the next video, if you're on YouTube, I'll see you guys next time.